Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Perth Writers' Festival. Um, my name is James Bradley. We are here for a session with China Mieville, um, which has the bizarrely 60s Swedish soft porn title of Inside the Imagination of Chinese China Mieville. Um, <laughs> um, I'm incredibly excited today to be able to introduce China. Um, China is, I think, to put it really simply, is a phenomenon. Um, you know, in the decade and a half, and I think you need to think about that, the decade and a half, we're talking 15 years, um, since he published his first novel, King Rat, he's published a number of no novels that are now regarded as contemporary classics. He's one of the architects of at least one genre in the new weird. He's managed to redefine the limits of fantasy, science fiction and horror. You know, he's won an extensive list of awards and honours. He's won the Arthur C. Clarke Award three times, and that would be more than anybody else. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Apparently. Apparently. <laughs> the Hugo Award, the British Science Fiction Award, the British Fancy Award, the World Fancy Award, many others. And he's developed a, a kind of large and passionate audience of readers. I think what makes that achievement even more remarkable is that China is in lots of ways an incredibly unconventional writer. You know, he produces books that are amazing not just for their kind of profligate inventiveness, but for their kind of density and political engagement. You know, whether he's writing about the extraordinary worlds of the Baz Larg books, and the critic Michael Durda once described them as an unweeded garden of unearthly delights, or seeking to revivify the subversive potential of new wave science fiction in his novel Before Last Embassy Town. His books are always engaged in this kind of active and often bracing interrogation of our assumptions about you know, technology, economics, language, narrative, reality itself. Um, China's new novel, Rail Sea, which was published late last year, is another dazzling book. It's a kind of wildly inventive Mad Max inflected riff on Moby Dick, um, set in a distant future where the oceans have been replaced by seas of twisting railroads. Um, and sailors cruise the rail sea in search of vast burrowing moles and what they call salvage, which are remnants of the technology of our world that's left ticking in the ruins of theirs. Um, but, you know, like all of China's books, it's much more than that. You know, it's a playful appropriation of the 19th century mariner's tale. It's a cautionary tale about capitalist greed. It's a meditation on the nature of narrative. You know, it's a subversion of the sentimentality, sentimentality of steampunk. You know, and then it's also this kind of thrilling and surprisingly moving adventure story in the end in the manner of Stevenson. Um, we're gonna to talk today about Rail Sea. I think we were planning to open it up quite early to questions. China was keen to take questions from the audience. We'll probably only talk for about half an hour here uh, and then we'll open up up to you guys to take questions. Um, I should warn you that China is sick as a dog. So <laughs> I don't normally walk around carrying a tissue. This is, uh, and who, if, to, the, to the people listening on, on, on the earphones, I, I will attempt to telegraph if I'm going to cough so you can take your earphones off. So yeah, so apologies if I, um, if I, if I, if I vibe subpar, I'm, I'm, I'm completely here. <coughs> Um, look, I thought we'd begin with Rail Sea. I mean, I, one of the things I find fascinating about Rail Sea is, you know, the book itself is a kind of salvage. It's a book about salvage, which is also a kind of salvage itself. You know, there's bits of Moby Dick there. But, you know, I mean, I, I have to say that I've seen in the reviews of it, I think the debt to Moby Dick is overemphasized. There's mm. a lot of Stevenson. Um, there's a lot, I think, of kind of 19th century mariner's tales. I, I was curious about that process of kind of drawing the influences into it. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. I mean, I, I um, to me, Moby, the M Moby Dick is obviously a very big hook, um, you know, that it's about the search for a giant white mole. Um, you know, I mean, it's not subtle. It's not a clever joke. <laughs> um, but so there's a very obvious kind of jumping off point. Um, but in terms of the structure of the book, in terms of the sh structure of the narrative, um, it, it deviates quite quickly from there and, and, as you say, goes much more off. It has a little, a little moment of Treasure Island here, a little moment of Kidnap there, that sort of thing, a little moment of Robinson Crusoe, that sort of so on. Um, I mean, for me, uh, there is that kind of tradition of, 
retelling a classic story, you know, in another setting. Often science fiction does this a lot. So it's like the, uh, you know, you know, Beowulf in the 25th century, or you know, the the the, the Finnish epic. What's it called the Kalevala? Yeah. yeah, you know, in you know, um, in in subspace or whatever it is. That's never particularly appealed to me because. I'm not so interested in kind of replicating the, sh the shape of a story that's already been told. Um, so from that perspective, I agree. I mean, I wanted to kind of bounce off from Moby Dick um, just because it, was, it just appealed to me as a really stupid joke, um, you know, a giant white mole. Um, but in terms of the salvage thing, I mean, I think salvage is something that I've been getting increasingly interested in in the last few years. And, um, you know, I, 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 when I was saying in another session, I, I, I have a long standing interest in in rubbish and garbage and there's a there's a lot of if people know that you know the Strugatsky brothers um novel roadside picnic for example this notion of reality being um a, a field of debris and discards from some kind of unknown apocalypse or something I mean, this just appeals to me and there's a you know the whole tradition of garbage planets um which, which is indeed a tradition. I mean, there's a whole set of texts and so on. So I wanted to do something, something along those lines. Um, and also because that, that model of salvaging, of just kind of piecing together bits from the ruins is, is, is one of the things that I think any writer or artist does all the time with, with influences anyway, both consciously and unconsciously. And particularly so in the fantastic tradition where we're incredibly aware of tradition, of antecedents, of ancestors, and so on. So I wanted to kind of, that seems to me to be a sub, sort of subliminal thread in pretty much everything, but I really wanted to bring it to the fore for this book. Hmm. I mean, it is one of the interesting things about the way that, I mean, your books particularly, but I think books within those fantastic genres work, is that constant awareness of tradition, but also yeah. that constant conversation with tradition. You know, and also, I mean, interesting in this book, you, there's kind of an act of self salvage going on as well, isn't there? Because there's, you know, there's the train of Iron Council yeah. you can see in there, and I, we were talking about this last night, but I mean, you know, there's that edge of priests in inverted world yeah. somewhere in there as well. I think, I mean, the thing is, I think any writer, you have your, your obsessions, you have the stuff you're really into, and if all you ever do is write the stuff that you're into, you become a, a kind of mannered self-parody very quickly. So one of the tricks, I think, of what you hope is, as a, you know, being a writer or an artist or anything, is, is knowing when to restrain yourself. So it's like, you know, I would be perfectly happy writing books about, you know, garbage and octopuses forever. Um, <laughs> but I feel like you have to restrain yourself. You have to, so, 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 and trains, trains is another, you know, my first book opens with an image of trains and then Iron Council obviously heavily influenced, you know, trains is a, a big thing in that. Um, and so, uh, so rail sea, I think, is probably my kind of last word on trains and rubbish for a little while. Um, <laughs> I'm allowed to talk about octopuses probably a book or two sooner than I can talk about rubbish again. So, um, and one thing that's incredibly <coughs> pleasurable about rail sea, I mean, look, with all of your books actually, is the use of language and the way that the language is engaged constantly in a kind of argument with itself. You know, uh, and it's it's. Uh, perhaps that process is sublimated to an extent in Railsea because you've got this kind of process of chasing the moles. I mean, there's a wonderful mm. moment where the moles are called a burrowing signifier, you know, yeah. and they're all chasing the philosophy of the mole. But I mean, that, that kind of linguistic richness and denseness and dexterity is one of the things that I think is often not present in fantastic genres. Do you see the books as having that kind of argument with language, that kind of argument yeah. with reality? I think, um, well, I mean, I hope so. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I am, I mean, I think what you say is true about the fantastic fields that we have, I mean, there are brilliant stylists, mm -hmm. obviously, in fantasy and science fiction, but I think it is also true that those of us that love them often love them um, for different things than prose, which means that I am much more likely to forgive fairly clunky prose than some of my friends who are not into the fantastic field. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm likely to forgive it, but at the same time, I'd, much, I'd be much happier, obviously, if, if there's prose that's aware of itself and that's sort of trying to play games with itself. And so that's why I'm interested in writers like, you know, like Samuel Delaney or so, someone who, who is kind of self-consciously playing with language at the same time as um, 
as actually using it to tell the story. Um, I mean, in the case of Railsy, there were a couple of things that came to the fore. One is, as you say, the, the whole kind of burrowing signifier thing, because one of the games I wanted to play was with, um, with Moby Dick. Moby Dick is so kind of obviously and ridiculously um, over the toply a kind of meaningful book. You know, what does the whale mean? What is the signification of the, you know, um, and, and, and it's been, you know, sort of uh, interpreted endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. And I, I'm, I have no sort of antagonism to that. I, I'm not someone who, who, I'm not one of these people who sort of like gets a bit kind of gore blimey about literary theory. I like that act of interpretation, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that you can't tease it. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of, I just liked the idea of a set of hunters that are hunting animals. And rather than have them hunt the animals and then have the theorists theorize about them hunting the animals, I thought you might just cut out the middleman and have the hunters theorizing about their own hunting. So, so they call these animals their philosophies, you know, and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm hunting the philosophy of the mole, you know. Um, and, and that kind of game, because I mean, I think Railsy, I hope, is quite a playful book um, and linguistically playful. And that's partly because I was writing with a, particularly with a slightly younger reader in mind. It, it, I feel like I was writing for myself aged about 12 or 13 uh, in particular. And there are certain games that I can, I feel liberated to play when I'm writing for a slightly younger version of myself that I feel I can't quite indulge in when I'm writing for, for an older version of myself. Um, even down to little, little kind of textual shenanigans like the use of the ampersand, um, which in the book, the word and is all, all the ands are replaced by an ampersand, including on the copyright page, I, uh, I insisted. Um, and. Um, and this has been very divisive. Some people hate it and find it very intrusive. Um, it doesn't bother me because I really like ampersand, but I'm not sure. And there's a reason for it as and, well. Yeah, and there is a whole chapter explaining the philosophy of the ampersand. <laughs> so, uh, um, but, but, but that kind of quite self-conscious playfulness, I think is something that I don't know whether I would feel uh, sort of liberated to do in a novel for, for, for a fully adult me. Mm. And this isn't a value judgment, it's just a different kind of tenor, you know. Mm. But certainly, I, I see, I, I am much more interested in, in books in any field that play around with language rather than pursue this, to me, unpersuasive notion of language as a clear pane of glass through which you see the story. I just don't think that's how language works. I'd much rather be aware of the, the, the various different sort of, you know, stained glass in the way of whatever I'm looking at. I mean, in that suspicion of language, and I think more broadly narrative and the kind of way language and narrative impose on reality, is it, it, it's all through Rousey, but it's all through Embassy Town. I mean, there's a kind of profound ambivalence about the role of language and the role of narrative. Yeah. Well, this is something, again, I, I was talking about this in an earlier session, but I mean, Embassy Town's quite a grumpy book in some ways because, um, I, it was part of the whole thing of Embassy Town for me was to have an argument with the phrase the healing power of storytelling, um, which if you Google that phrase, the internet explodes. Um, um, there, are, there are literally millions of sites that are about the healing power of storytelling. And my, my issue with it was simply um, that it tends to be simply given that storytelling is somehow healing. And so I wanted to, uh, and again, this is, this is not an original thing to do, but I wanted to do a book that was extremely suspicious of storytelling as a, as a you know, inevitably, because it's a story, it's trapped, you know, so it's, it's self-hating um, in one hopes a good way, um, but, but it is, it's very skeptical of the, um, uh, the kind of liberatory potential of narrative um, and the idea that narrative may just as well be a shackle as a, as a key. And is that something you found in the process of writing the books? I mean, I kind of, uh, I heard you say the other day that you'd felt increasingly skeptical of the idea of narrative or increasingly confused by the idea of story. Well, I mean, I think it's partly, it kind of depends what kind of writer you are. Like, I, I like a lot of very sort of avant-garde writing that, that, that is very anti-narrative, you know, sort of um, some of the kind of Ulipo writing or sort of high surrealist writing or, you know, very, very experimental writing or cut up poetry, language poetry or something which really, really has an incredibly combative relationship to, to language and to, and to narrative at all. But at the same time, 
you know, although I love that stuff as a, as, as a reader, I'm, that's not me as a writer. You know, I come out of a pulp tradition which is extremely defined by narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't see that as a, you know, as a, as, as a tragedy. I see it, I hope, as a kind of constitutive paradox so that I, I am someone who, as a writer, I find it very... Because I have sometimes sort of fantasized about or attempted to write really strongly anti-narrative stuff. And I kind of can't do it. I kind of can't sustain it. I think I just come too much out of a narrative tradition. But my hope is that, you know, coming out of that kind of pulpy narrative tradition, but at the same time having a great enjoyment and admiration for the skeptical tradition, maybe you can kind of invigorate each other and, and, and create a kind of uh, a sort of gnarly tension within the work. I mean, it's interesting because Certainly in your early work, one of the things you'd look to as one of the inspirations is Cthulhu, you know, and you, I mean, but I mean, that has a really interesting relationship to language, doesn't it, as well? Cthulhu. Hmm. We may have to explain what Cthulhu is. There are, <laughs> I, think there are, I think there are civilians among us. Um, um, all the geeks sit over here, all the civilians sit over here. Cthulhu, yes, Cthulhu, well, all right, Cthulhu is, for those who don't know, Cthulhu is the invention of, just out of interest, actually, can people who have no idea what Cthulhu is put up their hand? <laughs> oh, we're, it's a fairly civilian crowd. OK, all right. Um, <laughs> we need to bring that part of the conversation right. down, do we? <laughs> all right. All right. H.P. Lovecraft, great, uh, great, bilious, horrible writer of pulp, uh, purple prose pulp poetry in the 1920s largely, wrote a short uh, novella called The Call of Cthulhu. C-T-H-U-L-H-U. And Cthulhu is a giant monster which is basically a cross between a gorilla, an octopus, and a dragon. Um, work with me. Uh, <laughs> and the novelette, it's sort of a novelette, is, is, is basically somebody, uh, and, and the story involves an, a, a horrendous cult that wants to, to raise this creature up from under the water, and then there's a, a confrontation, and then it sinks down again below the waves. There's not really much of a story there which is part of the point, I think, that you're talking about. Um, and the story is pieced together. Quite literally, it is a set of found papers. And, what's, you know, the, the, and, and the, the, the narrator, such as he is, cobbles together the story from these patches of papers and, and, and sort of is able to reconstruct what's happened. And it's all a question of nightmares and sailors' tales about confronting this giant monster. It's an extraordinary piece of work. I mean, I recommend it very, very strongly. What's interesting about it is he was uh, very sort of rude, for example, about modernism. He was, he was very dismissive of formal experimentation. He thought of himself as an antiquarian and someone who wanted to kind of get back to kind of classical virtues and so on. Um, but in fact, the kind of behind his own back, I think of him as a sort of pulp modernist because he's doing this kind of fractured narrative of found um, shards that is almost kind of like Eliot or something mm -hmm. in terms of this kind of accretion of, a, of an unfinished story out of these kind of broken bits of other stories and so on. Um, and one of the things that I'm very interested in is this completely sort of um, self-denying overlap of the, the sort of pulp history and the, and the, and the high modernists. Mm -hmm. And what, they, what they're both trying to do in very different ways is estrange the reader and alienate the reader and defamiliarize, defamiliarize language, defamiliarize the world, so that you're reading in a state of constant shock. Um, and what's so interesting about that novel for me, that novelette, is that it is the kind of the high point of that estranging pulp tradition. So people think of pulp fiction as very straightforward tales of daring do. You know, you go out to, you know, the, the colonial guy goes out to Africa, shoots a load of monsters, comes home. Some of them are like that, but some of them are like these extraordinary extruded pieces of kind of idio savant avant-garde, mm. um, and that is one of them. Um, and so that process of estrangement, I think, is something that I'm very, very keen to, to tap into. Was mm. that your question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. But I mean, it's interesting. Uh, it's I also just a great monster. Yeah. I mean, if you like monsters, it's demented. It is a fantastic <laughs> monster. There's something very exciting about the creation of monsters that have no antecedents within a folklore tradition. If you think about, like, there's, there's a very big difference between saying, oh my god, it's a dragon, or oh my god, it's a werewolf or a vampire or whatever, and saying, oh my god, it is 
I have no idea what that is. You know, like <laughs> something that you have never, ever seen before. This seems to me to be quite a distinct thing. And Lovecraft, more than anyone else, was someone who invented a whole, crea a whole mythos of monsters that, that come ex nihilo. We've never seen anything like them before. Mm. It, is, it is interesting, though, isn't it? Because, in a sense, one of the most, most formally radical books of the late 19th century is Dracula. It's a pulp novel, mm. you know. But if you flipped it around, I was thinking when you were talking about Lovecraft as, as a kind of pulp modernist. I mean, in an odd kind of way, he's working in the same way that Tolkien is, you know. So you look at Tolkien and he, in a sense, he is the equal and opposite reaction to modernism. You know, he's a kind yeah. of anti-modern. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is interesting is that kind of anti-modern tradition is what a lot of contemporary fantasy is founded on, but it's also actually what you're writing against a lot of the time. That's a very interesting point. I mean, to me, what's key in this whole discussion is the First World War. The First World War is like the, the giant psychic crisis mm. against which all of these writers are writing, whether it's, even the ones that are writing beforehand, it's a kind of preemptive uh, act of, um, of, 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 of crisis management, I think. Um, um, and, uh, um, you know, so you have someone like Tolkien whose, whose reaction to the war is essentially a kind of um, tragic, sort of tragedy inflected um, nostalgia. Mm. Um, and then you have someone like Lovecraft who, 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 who's a kind of testerical shriek of angst. Um, um, and then you have people, you know, and this is where, and then, and then, then with the modernists, so you get someone like Wyndham Lewis or you get, you know, or, or Wolf or whoever who are also reacting against this crisis in a different way. Um, you know, I, you know, for, and that I think is very interesting in terms of that that moment as being the kind of key crisis that unites, if you like, high and low culture with, with loads of scare quotes around such, such you know, invidious adjectives. Um, my, my reaction as, as a writer to these things, because obviously I don't live in the shadow or the preemptive shadow of the war, so I'm sort of reacting to them more on a kind of literary level, even though sociologically I think that's the kind of source code of that moment. And so the, the, the kind of sociological things that I'm reacting to and th that are saturating me are very different, but always within this context of kind of liter literarily riff riffing off that tradition. Mm. Okay. Um, I thought, uh, look, I was curious, I was curious about asking you about comics, actually. Um, China, as well as writing novels, writes comics, and you draw them as well, don't you? Mm. Not the ones you're working on at the moment. Yeah, not. I mean, I draw. I draw some. I draw it pictures. I'm not really a very good artist, but I. I um, yeah, I do a bit. Yeah. Yeah, he's being modest. He's actually quite a good artist. Um, uh, if you've read the, all the pictures in Rail are yours, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Um, I can only draw giant animals. <laughs> <laughs> Which I mean, that'll do. You know. <laughs> can you draw hands? No, I can't draw hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's why there are very few people in any of my pictures. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I mean, is it something that you've done for a long time? No, I wrote a, I have a short story collection called Looking for Jake, which has a short comic in it, which mm. I wrote and was illustrated by uh, an artist called Liam Sharp, who's a very brilliant pen and ink artist. Mm. Um, but in the last few months, I've been writing a comic for DC. Um, and again, for the civilians among you, that is uh, Batman and Superman, not Spider-Man and the X-Men. Um, <laughs> so I've been doing a comic for DC. Um, but it's not something that I have a, a lot of history in. So, I, I, you know, it was quite a sort of steep learning curve mm -hmm. for me. But it's, there's two different things. One is there's the kind of formal aspects of writing a comic script um, in terms of how you actually, literally, how do you lay it out. And then there's the second question, which is, if you're writing for one of the big companies, particularly one of the big superhero companies, it's a very different thing than if you're writing uh, what they call a creator-owned comic or you have total control over the universe or you get to do whatever you want. That's a totally different issue. So one of the, you know, so if you write for DC, for example, and you sort of say, you know, here's my script, it's brilliant, Green Lantern dies on page three, you know, they go, no. <laughs> uh, Green Lantern does not die on page three, rewrite it, you know. And so, so there's the formal aspect of the actual writing of the script, and then there's the, the quite interesting aspect of writing something in a universe that you don't own mm. and you have no power over. And for some people that would be intensely frustrating, 
for me, as long as you go in with your eyes open and you intend to have more fun playing than frustration at what you can't do, you know, as long as you, as long as you you have your eyes open, I think it can be a lot of fun. I've I've been enjoying it, although um, the sales aren't that great. But I, you know, I think it's a, I I think it's really good. I, I enjoy it. Comicsology, go buy them. Well, uh... Dial H. It's called Dial H. It's about someone who finds a magic dial that randomly that turns them into a random superhero every time they dial. <laughs> it's not my idea. It's an old '60s thing that I, I re rebooted. So. Although the superheroes they turn into are considerably more strange now than they were in the 1960s. I think they're more self-consciously strange. The ones from the 1960s were pretty nuts, actually. I mean, there's, the, the, you know, I decided I wanted to reboot it because I was reading the old 60s ones, and there's one point where this kid, Robbie Reed, uh, dials. And because the thing is, you have this, again, it's to do with this shared universe thing. Because there was this incredible kind of uh, drive to create superheroes, what they didn't want to do, so they had, you know, Plastic Man and Superman and Batman and The Flash and Green Lantern and Catwoman and Black Canary and so on. And what they didn't want to do was replicate the powers of those already existing superheroes. So if they, when they invented a, a comic, which meant they had to invent two new superheroes every month, you can't make them look too much like the ones that already exist. So they get more and more bizarre um, because they just, they've run out of power sets. So about three issues in, and you can, you can tell this kind of slight edge of panic. Uh, so three issues in, like he turns into, you know, the human starfish. Um, and, and then he turns into King Coil, who is a giant animated steel coil who fights crime. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so it's kind of you to say so, but no, I don't think my superheroes are any more weird than theirs. You know, I can't possibly top King Coil. No. Did you, uh, did you end up doing it? I don't really understand very much about how people end up working for the company, <coughs> but you know, did they come to you saying you're the perfect person for Dial H, or did you go trolling through? I've got a friend who's doing some stuff at the moment. And he's been trolling through the DC archives, yeah. looking for weird characters, to, yeah. of which there are many in the DC archives to kind of resurrect. Yeah. No, what happened was, you know, I mean, if you have any kind of, uh, if you've been writing, particularly within the fantastic fields for any length of time, comics people will often sort of moot working together and so on. So I'd, I'd been sort of chatting to people from Marvel and DC and so on. And they, DC in particular, kept suggesting projects. I know this sounds incidentally like, this story sounds like it's invented for PR purposes. I promise it is absolutely true. Um, and so they would say, look, do you, want to re do you want to reinvent such and such? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? And we would have a discussion about it. And at the end of every conversation for the last five years, I would say, you should let me reboot Dial H for Hero. Because it was the one, I just thought it was just my favorite comic ever. And they were always like, yeah, whatevs. Um, and, then, and then eventually, suddenly, one of them, you know, one of the, 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 the leading guys in, in DC turned around and said, um, okay. And I was like, seriously? You know, um, so, so then it kind of went from there. So it was, it was, the reason I'm so excited about this particular one is because it wasn't that, I mean, the, they have suggested various things to me, but this particular one was the title that I really wanted to, you know, um, to, to, so people said to me, you know, why did you work for DC? But for me, I'm perfectly happy doing stuff with DC, but the, the, the point was if Marvel or Dark Horse or whomever had owned Dial H, it would have been them I was approaching about this particular project. Mm, that's interesting. The, the comic also does the most subversive thing you can do in a comic, which is the main character is overweight. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are two main characters. One is, it's interesting what you can and can't do with comics because the demographic of the comic reader. So um, what I wasn't allowed to do, what I wanted to do was have the main character be quite elderly. Um, and they said, no, that's just not, you can't do that. Um, but what... Uh, you know, so he's, I, I want it, so he's, um, he's out of shape, he's quite overweight, um, he smokes too much, he drinks too much and so on. And his, the sort of secondary protagonist is an elderly woman um, in her early, um, well it's never really specified, but she's, she's, she's much older than most characters in, in, in comics. And this was just because I wanted to try and, you know, have um, non-traditional non, non superheroes, really. Um, and because they change shape whenever they dial, I can get away with it. So, you know, it, um, and, it, and it, yeah, I mean, I, it, it, it's, it's fun. It's marvelous, by the way, if you haven't read it. Um, look, perhaps we should, now that we've indulged my passion for comics, perhaps, uh, we should open it up to the 
audience. Do we have people with questions? Squinting into the light. And we can just keep talking if there aren't <laughs> questions, but... Um... I was wondering if you could just give me some advice on how to deal with structure. How do you do <coughs> it? You're talking about planning a novel, right? Um, I, well, I think it's kind of like, do you know, do you know Kurt Schwitters, the artist, uh, who uh, kind of uh, experimental artist in the, in the 40s and earlier who uh, made these very strange um, cut-up collages and so on and kind of very strange abstract paintings. Um, and I was just seeing an exhibition of his and one of the things that's really noticeable is he's known for these wild, you know, collages. And then interspersing these are these really beautiful, very formally traditional oil paintings, portraits and landscapes and so on. Um, and this is that old, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a cliche, but the old thing about knowing the rules and being able to obey them before you can break them. Now, I think that's quite useful in terms of structure for, for novels because um, one of the things that stops people writing novels is this kind of panic at the scale of the thing, you know? And so I would say, you know, I, I would encourage you know, anyone who wants to write a novel to be as out there as they possibly can. But as a way of getting yourself kick-started, why not go completely traditional? Think three-act structure, you know, think, you know, you know, rising action, at the, you know, beginning the journey, then a, then a, you know, some sort of cliffhanger at the end of act one, you know, continuing up to the end of act two, um, and then like a big, you know, a big crisis at the end of Act 3, followed by a little denouement. Think, you know, think 30,000 words, 40,000 words, 30,000 words, so that's about, you know, that's 100,000 words. Divide it into, fi you know, 5,000 word chapters, so you're going 686. Six. Um, I, I realise this sounds incredibly sort of... Um, uh, sort of drab and kind of mechanical, but my feeling is the more you can kind of formalise and bureaucratise uh, those aspects of things actually it actually kind of paradoxically liberates you creatively because you don't need to worry about that stuff If you front load all that plan all that out so that you know the structure in advance And you know the rough outline of each chapter in advance Then when you come to each day's writing you're able to go off in all kinds of directions because you know what you have to do in that day You have to walk this character from this point to this point and you can do that in the strangest way possible. Um, whereas if you're looking at just a blank piece of paper and saying, where do I go from here? You, you end up kind of freezing, like it's, you know, the unwritten novel has a basilisk stare. Um, and so I would, I would say do it behind your own back um, by just formally structuring it in that really traditional way. And then when you have confidence and you've gained confidence in that, then you can play more kind of odder games with it. But it's really not a bad way to get started. Another lady at the back. Sorry, this is a really very geeky question. Um, well, you're sitting on the right side, so that's okay. <laughs> it's two parter. The first part is I bought Dal H just because you wrote it, but I really have to ask you. Okay, where did you get the idea that they would actually steal powers from other superheroes from other universes? Dude, spoilers. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there were so many civilians, so I didn't think it would be a bother. <laughs> Um, the what, second yeah. parter is from Embassy Town because, I mean, I, I know you think it's not too hard, but it really blew my mind. And I was thinking, how did you get the idea to have the protagonist actually become a simile? Like, how could people become similes? Like, that was just way beyond it. So I had to reread it a few times. I still can't get it. But <laughs> thank you, Mr. Meville. It's awesome. Shina, sorry, perhaps I. Perhaps you should, if you give them to people who may not know your work, explain what Embassy Town is about. Because it is, I mean, the conception of it is so extraordinary. Well, um, yeah, I'm going to duck the Dial H question. I'm sorry, because <laughs> I can't go. But, but the Embassy Town thing, I mean, basically, Embassy Town is set in a planet where uh, there's various odd things about the way the aliens speak in Embassy Town. They speak with two voices at the same time. But they also, they, they, it, it is a kind of linguistic impossibility because they have no sense of difference between word and thing. So they can't lie and what they, they can only speak things that they think that, 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 that they conceive of as true. Um, so, so they don't think of words as reference for things. They think of them as another, another version of the thing itself. And what that means is when they want to create, when, when they want to be able to speak with, with certain kinds of nuances, like with similes, like this is like that, the simile has to have happened for them to be able to speak it because they can't conceive of it unless it's actually happened. So the protagonist in Embassy Town is when she's a young girl, uh, 
a bizarre kind of ritual is performed around her by these aliens so that then in future they can say, oh, that's like the girl who ate what was given her in the abandoned restaurant. And if they hadn't done that, they wouldn't be able to say that because it hadn't existed. Um, and, and it all followed, to answer your question, it all followed from the notion of, it's actually to do with um, theological arguments about the Adamic language. There was a lot of, you know, th these debates, that in, 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 you know, hundreds of years ago, there was a lot of debates about what language do they speak in heaven? And it's these very strange debates to read. And one of the traditions of that debate was the idea that it was before language was fallen, and so it was intrinsically true. So each word actually like m meant the thing in a very direct way. So I was sort of thinking, well, what if there were aliens that actually speak that language? But in a funny way, although the, you know most of the most of the tradition, most of the philosophy depicts this as a very kind of as a much better language because it's not fallen into lies and so on. From another perspective, it's an incredibly impoverished language. That, that lacks certain nuances. And so I was thinking, well, what are the nuances that you, that you need to be able to express things? And I'm really, really interested in metaphor. And I'm also interested in simile, although to me, simile is a kind of incomplete metaphor. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking that, you know, it would be impossible for these, for these aliens to speak in metaphor because it's based on a complete lie. You know, Achilles is a lion. Achilles clearly is not a lion. But they might be able to say Achilles is like a lion if they knew what Achilles was and they knew what a lion was and they genuinely thought he was like the two. So I, I just thought, okay, so one of the main things they would have to do would be to go around creating similes so that they could express complicated, nuanced thoughts. Um, and then, you know, from there, I just, I liked the idea of, there were two things. One was having the main character be a simile, but the other was her having her not particularly care about that very much. She, she's relatively indifferent to it, in the same way as a lot of ex-child stars who don't continue in acting. It's not a big deal. It's something that happened when they were eight, whatever, it's done now. So, um, and, because, and part of the reason for that is I like books where something really strange happens, and the reader, I hope, really, really wants to know more, but the narrator can't be bothered to tell you because they don't care very much. <laughs> you know, um, so that's, that's where it came from. Do we have another question? Hello. I read um, Perdido Street Station and I read Iron Council um, and then I read Looking for Jake and a few others. Um, and it took me a while to figure it out, as you can tell, because I read you know, three books before it happened. Um, but it occurred to me that a lot of your work seems to be almost entirely without overt beauty. Is that a deliberate <coughs> thing? Is it a choice? Or is it just the way your mind works? Well, I think I would refute that, actually. Um, I think it's an interesting... I mean, I do think there's an element... I think it's partly sort of generational. I think when I was... I mean, you know, I was very young when I wrote Perdido Street Station. I can barely, I can barely empathise with that callow fool. You know, he was 28 or something ridiculous. And, you know, when you're that age, you know, one of the things, you know... I, so I think there was a certain... To, to, my, to my eyes now, I mean, I, you know, I, I like the book and I'm proud of it, but to my eyes now, there's a certain slightly embarrassing kind of, you know, it's very gritty, eyes are really gritty, <laughs> gritty, 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 you know, um, and, and it's like, yeah, all right, you know. All right. Um, and I think that maybe there's an element of that, you know, that you're kind of slightly trying too hard on that thing. Having said which, I think, I think I'm, I think I would refute it because what to me, I mean, it kind of depends on your definition of beauty. I mean, for me, what, what I'm interested in, in, in beauty is, uh, you know, what some sort of philosophers and artists and so on have called the sublime, you know, something which is kind of beyond representation and is often to do with, like, vastness and huge kind of vistas and so on. And so, for example, um, the image of, of, like, a trash sublime, the image of dunes of rubbish... I mean, it's not a traditional notion of beauty, but it is awesome, in, uh, and there is a kind of aesthetic power to it that I, that I relate to with a great kind of tug. So, uh, um, and, and you see that, for example, in Perdido and so on. Iron Council, I mean, a lot of the wilderness stuff in Iron Council, I, I, I mean, to me, is very much to do... It's a harsh beauty, I hope, but, it, but I, I, I would say it is a beauty. So what I would agree with is that there's not a very strong bucolic in any of the right. I'm not particularly interested in kind of pastoral. 
I'm not particularly appealed, you know, gardens don't particularly appeal to me. And, um, you know, but like, you know, mountains and, you know, like sort of, you know, deserts and stuff, that appeals to me. So, so I, I would say that kind of, that kind of beauty, I, I think, is, is there in, in, in the books a bit. But, I mean, I'm probably the worst judge of this. I mean, writers are often the worst judge of their own stuff. So, but that would be my defensive response, I think. <laughs> but that rejection of the bucolic, though, is also... I mean, it's, it's like the embrace of the kind of urban in it. It's about a, a pushback against that kind of fancy tradition about kind of looking backwards for, for roots and instead of about looking... I mean, you're, you're trying to write a kind of industrialised fantasy a lot of the time, aren't you? It's a kind of post-industrial... Yeah, to some fantasy. extent. I mean, I mean, I think, I think there, are, there are a couple of versions of the sort of the bucolic that do interest me. There's, a, there's, a, there's an amazing... It's funny, actually, having cited Iron Council, because one of the key influences on Iron Council is a short story by T.F. Powis called Lively Down Oddity, which is just the most extraordinary... It's very short, a very extraordinary piece of writing, which starts off with someone creating a garden in a wilderness. Um, but part of the reason I love it is because it's very exceptional to me, which is normally the notion of turning a wilderness into a garden would be really immiserating to me. But in this particular story, I really liked it. Um, but it's true that for the most part, I'm much more interested in um, very forbidding landscapes and or urban, urban landscapes than in sort of uh, small market town or garden landscapes. Mm. That is true. And that is partly a response to a certain kind of fantastic tradition, but I think it's also partly a kind of political thing and so yeah, on. And, that was yeah. the I mean, there's, there's things like, there's that extraordinary, and I'm sorry, I can't remember its title, but there's the Ikea ballroom story. Yeah. It's called The Ballroom. It's called The Ballroom, <laughs> which is one of a very short list of genuinely terrifying stories that I've ever read. You know, but it is something about taking the ghost story out of the creaky old house and sticking yeah. it in an Ikea. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, again, it's, it's not an original game to play, but essentially this, you know, the game of the non-traditional Gothic is a very pleasing game. It's like it's very, you know, it, I love the traditional ghost story, but it's, it's, you know, you stack the deck a little bit. You skew the curve if, if you are setting your ghost story in a kind of abandoned castle in the Scottish Highlands, you know. Uh, uh, and so it is quite nice to think about the most banal, drab piece of modern... Um, every day, and I mean genuinely banal, not depressing, like like you know, it, not 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 the sort of you know the the, the broken the, the kind of image of the kind of broken giant um, skyscraper full of you know the kind of Judge Dredd style image because that's already got a kind of gothic appurtenance to it. I'm talking about you know the minor tax office, you know, or or, or the you know the sort of um, you know the middling supermarket, you know, and there are, you know if you can if you can put a gothic there you're really talking about the quotidian gothic. That, I think, is, is, really, is really pleasing. And um, I have to say, I'm glad you like the boring. It wasn't my idea. That's actually one of the very, very few pieces I've ever collaborated on. That's, oh, really? Yeah, there was, there's three people, um, me and uh, uh, somebody called Emma Bircham and somebody called Max Schaefer, and we sort of worked on that together. Um, it was not my idea originally. Mm. We should go back to the audience, sorry. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned before that you've got this obsession with octopuses, garbage and trains. Do you know where that comes from or is that something that just kind of developed as you wrote? I don't know where it comes from. I, I suspect probably most people don't really know where many of their obsessions come from. I think, what I, you know, um, all I can say is... Uh, for me, and you know, I, you know, I look through pictures, for example, that my mum kept that I drew when I was three or whatever, um, and they're octopuses. You know, I mean, they just are. You know, so and, and you know what? You know, like you, you, you know, you've seen like kids who get completely obsessed with with dinosaurs or whatever. You know, and then so I you see. I think what happens is. I think what happens is a lot of kids have these obsessions with whatever it might be. And then for a lot of them, it kind of ebbs as they get older. And for some of us, it, it doesn't ebb. And it is possible to become massively obsessed with something later in life. But I think it's probably less common than simply being obsessed with it from the moment you're essentially sentient and it just kind of um, not, not, not really going away. So I, I genuinely have no idea where it comes from. I remember being about six and I had one of these books that was... Um, uh, it was a book uh, about like 
Saving the Planet. It was a kind of early eco book. And it had all these kind of very kind of warning photos of, um, of like kind of terrible environmental, um, you know, spoilage and, you know, despoliation and so on. And I remember, this actually gets to something you were saying, I remember going to my mum, being very young, and not having the language to say it, but saying to her, look, this, this, this picture of, you know, like this kind of endless hill of tyres and, and sump oil and stuff, I know that they're showing me this because it's horrible, but it's quite beautiful as well. And not being able to express it, um, but that was, bef you know, before I even had the language to say that. So, so no, I genuinely have no idea why. Um, what I end up doing quite a lot is a kind of post facto rationalizing, and I, 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 can, I can work out where those interests dovetail with my more conscious interests later on, whether they're political interests or aesthetic or so on. But it, that's a work of analysis, not a work of explanation. China, would you mind telling us a little bit about the genesis of your writing career and, and how publishers received your writing? Because now we're sort of looking at it in terms of your, your extremely well established and you set up the architecture uh, for this, well, it's not a new genre, but your very own architecture. And yet, in terms of carving your path at the beginning, was it difficult to find publishers who, who were willing to take it up? I think I was quite lucky, really. I mean, I, my, my first book, I, you know, I'm not someone who has a drawer full of un, unsold manuscripts. Um, my fir the first novel I wrote, I sold. I didn't sell it immediately, but um, uh, it, 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 in some ways, it's a, a much more straightforward book. This is King Rat. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, again, I mean, I was ridiculous. I was very young. I, 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 it, it was, um, I was going to a lot of drum and bass clubs at the time, and it was uh, so it's a supernatural thriller set in drum and bass clubs. Um, <laughs> don't judge me; I was 26, you know. Um, um, but you know, and, and there's aspects of it that, to me, you know, resonate very clearly with the stuff that comes later. In fact, in one quite important respect, Railsea is an extended rumination on the first line of the first chapter of King Rat. So I do maintain a kind of echo chamber relationship with the earlier stuff, but. It, you know, I, I sent it out to a few agents and an agent picked it up and then she sent it out to a few publishers and one of them picked it up and so on. Pedido then, which was this, you know, this big secondary world fantasy sort of kicked it to a much bigger level, I think. My, my sense is that I've been very lucky because um, from Pedido and The Scar and Iron Council, which are the three books set in the same world, I quite consciously didn't want to write Perdido Street Station and then Perdido Street Station 2 and Perdido Street Station 3. I wanted to try and change them as much as possible. And then after Iron Council in particular, try and write very differently book to book. Um, and on the one hand, you know, obviously publishers and many readers like it if you, if you write broadly the same kind of book each time. Um, and that's, you know, that's fine. It's not, you know, I mean, if you like a certain kind of thing, it makes sense that you're going to like a certain kind of thing. Um, but I think I've been quite lucky because I think from a relatively early stage, um, my impression is that I've had uh, a sufficient core of readers who are willing to indulge me in trying out new things. And I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I feel very... I mean, it sounds kind of unctuous, but I feel very lucky because I don't think you can presume that. I mean, all, what you're doing every time you try something different is you're saying to readers, you know, you don't owe me to read this, even if you've liked every other book, but it would be great if I could persuade you to give it a try. And if you try and do something as different as you can each book, inevitably, some readers are not going to like some, and they're going to like others more, you know. And, and so I think the, 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 the bet and the, the hope, the aspiration, is that over the course of a of a career over the course of several books, you create an interesting arc that is more interesting than if you essentially wrote a very similar book each time. Um, and I think, so, so I think um, there certainly have been times with some, you know, early on with some publishers and so on when there was a certain kind of jostling for position and jostling to try and work out exactly what we were going to try and do and what kind of writer I was going to try and be and so on. But I think from, I would say from sort of Iron Council onwards, um, because Iron Council was very different from the books that went before it, um, which may partly be why 
so few people like it compared to those books. Although, to me, it's the best of the three, but that's a separate issue. Um, I think from then on, I think the publishers, they, they feel... I, I think I've been very lucky, because I think my publishers sort of feel that, um, you know, people that like my stuff are at least interested in the experimentation, uh, so they're willing to give it a punt, I, I guess is the idea. But I'm quite aware that I think I've had a, a, a sort of an easier and a luckier ride than a lot of writers. I don't take that for granted. I think it's also a question of when I started being published. I think if I had started being published even like, even three or four years later, I think it would have been harder uh, in certain ways because there was more of a kind of, um, of a kind of slightly fervent um, machine to, to try. I mean, you know, you can fight your corner. You, you, no one can make you write what you don't want to write. When writers complain that you know their publishers are forcing them to write certain things, and it's like, I mean, you know, they don't have a gun to your head. But certainly, if you want to make a living at it, you know, they, they will make a strong case that a certain thing is going to be more commercial than another thing. Uh, but I think if I had been, if I'd been writing a few years later, when there had, was quite a big wave of kind of alternative fantasy. Um, they, they, they might, there might have been more pressure to do a certain thing. And there certainly would have been more pressure to have a blog and a Twitter feed and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. And so it's a bit of a vague answer, I'm afraid, but I, I don't know if that answers the question. Music plays a significant role in King Rat and in your recently published polemic, London Overthrown, you refer to a <clears throat> Um, a London producer known as Burial that's providing the perfect soundtrack to the London you describe. Some general comments about the influence of music on your writing and some Desert Island discs. <laughs> um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, music is... I'm quite ignorant about music. I mean, I'm not a... Especially about classical music. I'm not someone who has a strong um, understanding of the field, but I... I, I I mean, I, I listen to a lot of music and I write listening to music. And there's music that I love but I can't listen to when I'm writing, music that I listen to when I'm writing that I'm, you know, just works very well and so on. And what tends to happen often is, um, you know, with every particular book, there's a certain kind of emotional tenor that I want to tap into. And I'll often make, these days, I mean, probably like a lot of people, what I end up doing is making a playlist and then... Um, and I'll have a playlist of a certain set of songs that have a certain kind of emotional resonance that feels appropriate to to the particular project, um, and then I'll put them on uh, on shuffle or you know sometimes just on loop a single song, and it sometimes it goes down to an individual chapter. You know there was a chapter of the scar where. There, there's a, a group of people in a submersible um, and they're being attacked by monsters underwater, which I wrote over about four days. And basically I listened to, there is a, there's an avo paired piece of music called Sarah Was 90 Years Old, which is this incredibly pared down, very sort of scary kind of percussion piece. And I just listened to that solidly on loop for four days, you know. Um, so it, yeah, it, it, it varies, uh, um, I think with, Embassy Town, I was listening to a lot of Benjamin Britten for some reason. Um, you know, I, I can't always explain why, but, you know. In terms of Desert Island uh, discs, um, the ones that jumped to mind, I mean, you mentioned Burial, so I would say, uh, for me, I, I mean, I think Burial, if anyone doesn't know his work, he's, he's just an outstanding, amazing um, musician, London musician, uh, and he's just got a new EP out, and his, of which the first song, Truant, I think is the best thing he's ever done. It's extraordinary. Um, Public Enemy, probably, probably Fear of a Black Planet. Um, was that the tut? Did somebody tut at Public Enemy? <laughs> oh, yeah. 21st birthday, Brixton Academy, Public <laughs> Enemy. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Britain, um, probably, uh, probably, Oh, the cello suite. Um, oh, what else? Um, probably a Wu Tang track, although I'm not quite sure which one. Um, do you want more? I mean, how's that for a start? There you go. <laughs> We've probably got time for one more question. Mr. Melville, thank you very much for speaking us to, to us Sorry, today. Sorry, could you wave? I don't know. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, sort of an extension from a previous question. 
Uh, in King Rat, there's a wonderful scene where a jungle producer is putting together a track, taking different influences that they've just found, stretching them, making them something new and amazing. <coughs> Do you see your writing as a, almost a literary extension of that sort of creativity? Yes. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. I mean, that's, that, there's a whole scene. I know the scene you're talking about. I mean, I wrote it, you know, 15, 16 years ago, but you're absolutely right. She talks about zombie sounds and she talks about pickling music. And the whole model of sampling gets right to the question of sal salvaging, as you were talking about. And I mean, I, I do. I mean, to me, it, that's what's most interesting about creativity. This also, this is what Schwitters does, um, is, is just, you know, takes scobs and bits and pieces and grots of stuff that's already there, puts them together in new ways, stretches them, mucks around with them, hits them with hammers and tries to make something new. So, yes, I do, I hope. It's possible we have time for one more. Um, your books are based in uh, quite obscure universes. How do you start with the universe? It sounds like you begin with an idea and then explore that idea via universe. But how do you keep that coherent? Well, some of them are. I mean, some of them are set in our universe, but just with, with, with different rules, um, like Kraken, or some of them are set in corners of our universe that don't that happen to not actually exist, like the city in the city or so on. So, but when I'm doing something which is set in a completely invented world, uh, I mean, different writers do this in a different way. My own feeling is, you know, um, I mean, I've only done it systematically with the one world, Bas Lag. And um, so I don't think this is the way to write universes. But for me, that particular universe was always conceived of as um, incredibly teeming. Like, I, I wanted it to be just, like, full of stuff. And so rather than worry too much about kind of systematic realism, um, you know, some, some creators of secondary universes, for example, you know, will kind of incredibly rigorously kind of, you know, map sort of, um, you know, river flows and, you know, work out, you know, the sort of, you, you know, the kind of uh, the, the, the seasonal variations of this. Now, I don't, I, I don't have the patience for that. I mean, for me, it's much, you know, I'll draw some maps and I'll draw some timelines, but I leave a lot of gaps because I think uh, it's often quite interesting to not know everything about the universe you're creating. Um, and then I just like threw in lots of stuff. So rather than think, so if I thought of like a cool monster, um, I would just say, yes, that exists in there. And then if I thought of another one, I would say, yeah, that also exists in there. And rather than thinking, well, how would they relate? How would they have both evolved? They have a completely different physiological morphology. What would be the Darwinian mechanisms by which they would both inhabit the same world? I'm kind of like, yeah, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, so, so that particular world is just my kind of indulgent rag bag of cool stuff. Um, you know, if I, if I did, you know, I mean, in, which is not the case, for example, with Embassy Town. Embassy Town, there is a much more of a systematic notion of the kind of kind of growing sense of that planet and so on. It really depends on the universe. Um, so you know, um, so 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 I think for me that that one, it, it's about leaving gaps and it's about you know enjoying the sense of the totality and and having a sense of a kind of mucky contingency. I really like that sense of mucky contingency. And one of the things you can do is retcon and kind of retrospectively make sense of something that can't possibly make sense. So if you have a creature like the Kepri in Bas Lag, which is like it has a human female body and its head is a giant insect, um, like a whole insect, like a bug, like there's no way that could possibly have evolved. But if you start from saying, I want that because it's cool, and then you have to retrospectively construct some absurd sequence of events by which it could have come into being, that can be quite a productive... Um, uh, exercise. This is kind of genre as Ulipo. Um, so, so I like doing things like that. Right. I, I think we do have to end it there. Um, I'd like you to thank <laughs> China. Thank you